I will try my best. Um, so uh, my name is Mark McLean. I am the former PTL of Neutron. So I want to talk a little bit about deploying Neutron. A little bit is talk about where we're going today. Uh, for some, Neutron can be kind of this long winding road. You don't kind of know what's behind the next hill. Um, so when we really take a look, first of all, we really want to ask a few basic questions. Um, Multi-tenancy. It's kind of an odd question to ask in cloud deployments, but whether you're big or small, sometimes you need to really answer the question, Are you high, do you have high, high multi-tenancy? You have lots of different individual either users, applications you want to isolate from each other, or maybe you're low. Um, some of those decisions do play into when we get to a couple um, points down the road. Um, also, do you need to isolate tenants? Um, in some deployments, you don't need high, you don't need isolation. You can make your deployment simpler and, and generally just skip over it. But even if you do trust your tenants, sometimes you do want to isolate them. One of the biggest benefits you can do is you can limit the amount of L2 traffic that different applications see. Um, and some of the deployments in some of the places I've worked, we had very low multi-tenancy. We trusted everybody, but one of the biggest complaints we got from application developers was is they were seeing too much broadcast traffic from other applications um, in the data center. And they just found it annoying when they were troubleshooting. So one of the other questions a lot of times often deal with when you're deploying is what kind of isolation do you want? Um, the lowest hanging fruit is to use VLANs. So, you know, it's 802. 802.1Q, it's VLAN tagging. It's supported in about every cheap NIC you can find. Um, you know, it's widely supported. There are a limited number of VLANs. You get about 4,000-ish, you know, more technically, but most switches kind of start having problems when you get even to like 3,000 because the default configs will limit the ranges of available VLANs um, within the switch. One of the other interesting things about that is, you know, if you have over 4,000 tenants, this is obviously a problem, and then you should have to start doing tricks with trunking, programming, and switches. Um, also, the underlay has to support the topology. So typically when you're running VLANs, you end up with a very large L2 domain. One of the problems that creates is you have a problem with the number of instances you can boot. Um, you know, as you start getting the MAC tables of the switches can start overflowing, and then you start running into problems because depending on your vendor, some of your hardware may only allow 50,000 ARP entries in the switch. Some may allow 100,000 ARP entries. Some may tell you they will allow 100,000 ARP entry until you enable this really awesome management feature that then all of a sudden takes up all the available space. Alternative week, we can do GRE or VXLAN tunnels. Basically, it's L2 and capped in um, layer, four, layer 3, layer 4. Um, it's routable. You can basically go with what you typically find in you know, current data center design when you find different cloth fabrics. Um, it's easy to expand because you can add racks at a time. It's immediately routable. Um, you, can, you can move instances around because the tunnels kind of make the location instance somewhat transparent. Um, there's a little bit of increased packet overhead when you add the when you add the uh, VLAN tag. It's relatively small. GRE and VXLAN both have um, additional header information you have to put. Um, it's easier to grow to deployment because you're not having a very large L2 domain. You, it's basically you can scale up each one of your routes um, routing domains. Typically, what you'll find with people deploy in this um, style, what you'll see top of rack switching with a full mesh at the top. Um, also. If you have very large deployments, one of the things to consider is L2 population. So as you start spinning up tunnels, you still have the same problem we all have with traditional networking anyway, which is how do you find instances? So if we have hypervisors A, B, C, and D, and you spin up two instances in hypervisor A and D, as you have really large, and if the instance on A needs to talk to D, it's got to actually flood and discover it on all the hypervisors. Now, some of the options and choices um, will do what's called L2 population for some of the controllers. And by knowing the entire logical state of the network, you can either via um, pre-populating the affording base, you can actually say where um, to send any broadcast traffic or unknown traffic. What that does is reduces the amount of traffic within your data center. So also another one of the considerations is for kind of layer three. Um, gen and generally with layer three and Neutron, it really depends on your provider because they're all over the place. But I'll talk a little bit about what the reference implementation looks like. So when you take a look at the reference, you typically have your hypervisors. You have a network node. Um, it has a core. The network node, typically you'll have more than one of these. 
um, in the latest you know, release, you can actually run HA pairs. So within that network node, you have a network namespace, which basically acts as a little virtual router. It does simple forwarding, um, also does NAT for any floating IPs. One of the problems with that network node is to say if you have a really noisy neighbor, and so we start up our VM, let's say it's getting lots of traffic, or even worse, you're running a public cloud and they're actively DDoSing on the outside, you can end up where the point where the VM starts generating so much traffic, it saturates your network node all the way up, blocking basically traffic for anybody else. So one of the things that's coming, in, and it's available in Juno, but as a deployer, I wouldn't recommend running the Juno version, mainly because it needs more testing. It's what's known as distributable virtual router. And what this does is we actually create little routing instances on in the open source version on each of the hypervisors and route directly um, to the core of your network if you have a floating IP associated with the instance. The floating IP is kind of the key point. Um, in this case, it does, per so when people talk about DVR support or not, basically it's doing routing directly from the hypervisor. So when we actually talk about the deployment options, we have several drivers and plugins. We have 19 of them in all. Um, they run the game in terms of features and support. Um, some are open, some are not. Um, some. So when you take a look at, you know, there's lots of choice you talk to everybody, but basically what you want to do is when you start considering is considerations. Um, some of the deployments have a central network controller. It's basically a cluster um, system that's, you know, a lot of times they're based on Cassandra, Hadoop, or, or Zookeeper. You run that cluster, and then what Neutron is doing is Neutron is an API fronting it. Um, there's, a few of the situ there's a few of the solutions which do not have a central cluster and rely on Neutron's database. So in terms of operational complexity, you have to decide whether or not you want to have multiple systems that are proxy for each other or want to have an internal one. There's also scaling limits. Um, the number of hypervisors that the different solutions support, the number of ports that they support is wildly different. Um, some of that comes into the calculations necessary if you're, say, going and doing a full open flow central control. The more ports you add, the more calculations it takes to write all the appropriate flow rules everywhere. Um, also, in terms of scaling limits, one of the problems you have is as, as you get super large, um, you have to, what can happen sometimes is you can actually have more flows than will fit in the switch table. So as packets traverse the topology, they will actually get bumped up into user space. And even worse, sometimes you may not have the information local in the user space version of the switch, and that packet will actually get um, kicked up all the way to the central controller, which has a very high latency for the first packet. So when you're going through and evaluating these, that's one of the things to check is what the latency is on the first packet. In some cases, that overhead's acceptable, and for other cases, you may want to consider a different um, solution. IPv6, um, it's been around for 20 years. If you're making a new deployment without it, you're messing up. You know, Go ahead, put IPv6, build it in. Um, also, levels of testing. Um, as Michael hit on, the level of testing, while all the Neutron drivers do have third-party CI that are in the tree, um, there's varying levels. Some will do very basic checks, some do very deep checks. Also, some of them um, will only support, uh, sadly, some of the drivers will only support v will only support IPv4 and not IPv6. So check into the level of testing. And also into the level of support. Um, if it's a proprietary solution, the level of support, or even some of the level of support for the open source bits. Um, some have better documentation than others. Some have wider, bigger communities than others. So if we were to dive in specifically into the open source options, um, so within Neutron, we have what's called Modular Layer 2. Basically, it's a drive. we took our plugin interface, and if you think about uh, Neutron uh, plugins, it's just like having an engine of a car. You get one plugin. Um, is ML2 allowed you to have multiple drivers um, for that engine? And so OVS is open vSwitch. It's basically a user space switch that's available wildly, uh, widely in every distro um, currently. Or alternative Linux, Linux Bridge, which is basically a switch you know, on the bridge that's using just basically traditional kernel constructs. Um, OVS will support a protocol known as OVSDB. It also supports... Um, um, OpenFlow, which some people like, some people don't like. Um, there, the simplicity of running Linux Bridge allows you to use all the standard um, IP root 2 utils that everybody's used to and loves. Um, 
as well as there's others such as Open Contrail, which is a very which is like a layer three based um, system. It's you know originally was created uh, by a division at Juniper. It's been spun out. There's multiple companies that support it. Open Daylight has a wide has a foundation with um, multiple members that support Open Daylight. Um, it's a Java based. The interesting thing about Open Daylight is it's pluggable as well. So what you end up with is Neutron fronting, which is Neutron itself being pluggable into a very pluggable backend. So it's really hard to say. Open Daylight is a specific implementation because of the number of choices. And then lastly, you have Ryu, which is an open which is an open flow um, based controller framework um, that supports very in what in their most current work is a very distributed um, local. Basically, they're using little mini controllers that they're able to distribute on each of the hypervisors. So. I know I went through a bunch of different choices. Um, the architecture guide goes through a lot, even in more detail than I could cover in 20 minutes of you know Mac table entries, different options for deployers, how you want to choose, um, as well as the admin guide of deploying these things. Um, with Neutron, it's really difficult to just because there's so many options, and Neutron's really a thin wrapper, wrapper in terms of API. So, with that, questions. None. Oh, yes. <laughs> what time? What time is it? You're 15. talking about IPv6 there. Um, I'm new to OpenStack, and when I first started looking at the networking side of things, I was a little taken aback, and the network engineer in me was a bit horrified at all of the NAT and stuff. Mm -hmm. How does it? How does it change when you're using IPv6, which doesn't map very well onto the NAT model? Like, how do, does floating IPs have a different semantics, that sort of thing? Yeah, so floating IPs in, in OpenStack currently right now, floating IPs are only supported for IPv4. Um, many of us are very strongly opinionated that IPv6, you should have direct routing to the host. We don't want to add NAT into the data path. Um, so currently what you would do is, so our IPv6 support actually comes in several flavors. You can delegate a prefix to the network. You can use Slack, which is stateless auto configuration. Um, we also support DHCP, uh, DHCP v6 in both forms. So you get both stateful, um, which was very close to what you would find in traditional like v4 DHCP services, and then DHCP stateless, where you get a router advertisement that basically auto-generates your IP address, but you can also pass, um, tell the client to make certain requests to DCP server for additional optional fields. So most of that support uh, for the DCP services was uh, primarily driven by Comcast, which is, a, which is an, at least in the U.S., has been a very huge proponent of making V6 as fast as possible, is, is close to the spec and what you would actually want to deploy as possible. Um, for their internal use cases. So that's why we didn't want to um, support NAT. And even for the foreseeable future, I don't see the Neutron team adding V6 NAT, even though we do get requests for it. So floating IPs will exist for V4, but in terms of V6, you can actually, uh, there's work to add multiple prefixes so that you can renumber and have transitional periods. Um, but um, what we're because so much V6 range is available that everybody most deployers should be able to get a large enough block that they can have fully uh, publicly available IPs. I just want to pick on that a bit further. Mm -hmm. So the most common use case I see for floating IPs is I want to have something in uh, DNS but I might want to pull the instance out from underneath and have, use it for a different instance, right? So how does that work in a v6 world without floating IPs? So one of the things we're also working on is extracting out the IPAM system in Neutron in Kilo so that you can actually reserve a static allocation for you reserve the IP address itself as public in your network and then you can assign it to you can assign it to ports and physically move that address without having it returned to the pool between ports. Okay. Um, additionally, uh, we're adding support for the, with the rewrite of load balancing that so you can have your VIP, because typically most people want a well-known IP in a lot of cases is associated with their load balancer, um, although we do see it with single instances as well. Just would like to hear your opinion uh, on OpenV switch in terms of scalability and also um, how stable it is. Uh, 
in particular the um, recent versions of open, open vSwitch running with recent versions of the kernel? So um, there are several deployments right now that are running open vSwitch, uh, very large deployments that are running open vSwitch. So it's relatively stable. Um, in terms of scalability, it really depends on what you have driving open vSwitch. Um, we have the reference implementation, which will scale, which doesn't scale to super large nodes, number of nodes that can drive open vSwitch. Open Daylight via OVSDB can drive open vSwitch. Um, there's a few proprietary solutions which um, drive open vSwitch in addition to the proprietary vendor's hardware. Um, in general, it's been very stable. In, in some cases, some folks will find high utilization of CPUs. Um, also, for some of the usage, one of the interesting, for one of the current things, if you're not using a central open flow controller, right now with vSwitch doesn't have um, connection tracking. So in terms of how you would support uh, security groups and OpenStack, you end up having to have this separate, um, basically logical hop on the machine where you have to route the packet through a bridge so that the packet's visible to NetFilter currently. Um, it will probably be sometime this year, later this year, when some of the support for open vSwitch will better integrate with NetFilter so that you can write the appropriate rules. Also with connection tracking so that you can write the flows better without having to have a central controller. Um, and what many folks have found with some of the enterprises and some of the um, smaller installations where they don't want a central controller is that the uh, functionality provided by the bridge utils in Linux is more than adequate for many of the deployments. Also, um, if you're doing, one of the early benefits of OpenVSwitch was that you could get tunneling in terms of, for the folks using proprietary STT or VXLAN, now that VXLAN is native in the Linux kernel, you get a lot of the same benefits already. Um, as a matter of fact, OpenVSwitch now can take advantage of those. Um, additionally, some people like running DBDK with OpenVSwitch and get some of the pipeline processing in terms of reducing uh, CPU utilization. Um, some of those features are a little bit more advanced, a little bit more bleeding edge, so it really depends on, you know, size of your deployment scale. Um, also, what kinds of features you want to push? Do you have a large ACL set? Back. Anything else? All right, thank you.